It is a joy to be with you to look through the book of Hosea for several sessions in our study through the whole content of the Bible. One of the great privileges we have in doing the School of Biblical Studies is to go through the whole content of Scripture. And the way we're going to look through Hosea is we're going to take several sessions and simply ask some of the inductive Bible study questions that you've been given earlier in the course, in the introductory uh, weeks of the course. And uh, on about my fourth session, I'm going to be sure that you are progressing well uh, through your own work of your first and second readings, etc. Et uh, but what I want to do in the beginning is to just kind of ask some of these wonderful inductive Bible study questions that we have of the text so that we can really get into the text better. And I was uh, speaking to Phil before uh, we started filming this morning about the first time that the Lord ever actually spoke through me prophetically. He did a very similar thing that he did to Hosea here in chapter 1 and verse 2 and that I spoke to myself uh, prophetically through my own mouth. And uh, I didn't really understand it because I'd never really read Hosea. And I remember the first couple of times I read through Hosea, I thought, gee, there in chapter 1 and verse 2, that's exactly what God did with me. So as we consider this book then, 197 verses, uh, 111 of those 197 verses are predictive. We want to just kind of go through the book and just try to get a real clear picture on what God was wanting to say through this man uh, to the nation of Israel. And Hosea was a prophet to the north, although he mentions Judah uh, over five times in the book. And so what I want to do with you is just take you through some of your observation questions and just ask these observation questions and then answer them. And the reason I want to do that is to help you work in putting paragraph titles together and making charts. And it is wonderful, by the way, that you can make charts on computers now. Uh, in the days when uh, Phil and I started, we did our charts on pieces of paper about this size. And this is actually the chart that I did 30 years ago in Hosea. And I still use it, and I can still teach from it, so that says that what you're doing you can teach from. They are very valuable. Uh, inductive Bible study is more than charts. Inductive Bible study is actually a way of thinking. It's a way of addressing literature. And so I want to uh, just begin by just asking some of these wonderful questions. And I, the first question I want to ask is, what is uh, a main repeated idea in the book? This is something that we can go through in every book, really, in the Bible. What is a main repeated idea? And I will just show you several passages as we go through here, and you can conclude what you'll conclude as we look at these repeated ideas. In chapter 1 and verse 2, the Lord first spoke through Hosea. He said to him, Go take to yourself a, a wife of harlotry, of children of harlotry, for the land commits great harlotry by forsaking the Lord. That's 1 verse 2. Then in chapter 2 and verse 13, and I will punish her, talking about God punishing Israel for the feast, days of the Baals, when she burned incense to them, decked herself with her ring and, and jewelry, and went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. And then we have chapter 4 and verse 12, where God says, My people inquire of a thing of wood, and their staff gives them oracles, for a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they had left their God to play the harlot. And here you see... These three verses are all talking about idolatry. And uh, we have in chapter 7, verse 16, I'll just take you through some more of these. 7, 16, they turn to Baal. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. And so we see here that one of the main repeated ideas in the book is idolatry. Chapter 8 and verse 5. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. This is talking about the golden calf that was put up in Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will it be till they are pure in Israel? And that golden calf, of course, was put up under Jeroboam I. And the interesting thing is that idolatry actually began under Solomon. If you look at the late part of Solomon's life, that's really where idolatry came to be a real part of the nation, which is really sad to think that idolatry came into the nations of Israel and Judah through the son of David. Of course, in the Judges period, we see that it was there as well. But it really kind of became institutionalized under Solomon when he started building all of these temples for these foreign wives that he had married in disobedience to the Lord in, in uh, Deuteronomy. Chapter 9 and verse 10. 
Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel like the fruit on, uh, first fruit on the fig tree in its first season. I saw your fathers. But they came to Baal Peor and consecrated themselves to Baal. Now it's very interesting, this word consecrate. The word consecrate is related to the word sanctify or to make yourself holy. And what we see from this word consecrate is that it's actually a neutral word. That the word holy, the word sanctify, the word consecrate is a neutral term. You can consecrate yourself to good or consecrate yourself to evil. And what we see here in chapter 9 and verse 10 is that the uh, nation of Israel had consecrated itself to Baal. They had set themselves apart to worship Baal. Uh, if you can imagine how terrible that is, that here you have in the year about 740, uh, just a couple of hundred years after King David, you have a nation that is utterly committed to idolatry. One of the things King David did, he, you know, David did a lot of wrong things, but one of the wrong things he did not do was idolatry. He did not put up with it. And just to think that that, that soon after this great king, uh, this man after God's heart, the nation is, is, is committed. Think of your own commitments. You're committed to the Lord. But you see here, it says that these people were committed to Baal. They, didn't, they weren't just kind of casual worshipers. It says they were consecrated. They were set apart to him. And it's a terrible thought. Chapter 10 and verse 1. Israel is a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. As his country improved, he improved his pillars. And notice this terrible statement in 10.1. That Hosea says that the more well-off and the richer that Israel became, the more idolatry they got involved in. He says, he says they, they built more altars and they actually improved their pillars. And the pillar there was a, uh, oftentimes it was a pole, maybe six, eight, ten feet high. It was often shaped like the male member. And these pillars were uh, there in the midst of the groves and the high places for the people of Israel to be involved in this idolatrous worship. And God says here in 10.1 that the richer they got, the better they wanted to make their idols. And it's just a terrible thing. And it goes back here to chapter 9 and verse 10 where it says they had actually committed themselves. They had, they had made a commitment to idolatry, to Baal. This wasn't just... Uh, just uh, intermittent. It wasn't just a haphazard thing. They were committed to idolatry. Chapter 11 and verse 2, we see that God says, The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. And so you see this repeated theme, chapter 13 and verse 2, chapter 14 and verse 8. It's a repeated idea in the book. So being inductive Bible studies we uh, students, we think about this. We say, okay, they were... They were committed to Baal. They were, they were completely into idolatry. And one of the things that, another question that that should spur in our mind is, okay, so uh, what, what then would God do relative to this? What, uh, 